Welcome to Friends with Deficits. I'm your host, Adam Sultan, and my next friend is Erica Marcoux. Erica is a mindfulness instructor and a yoga teacher in Austin, Texas, with a master's in counseling psychology, and she's also host and producer of the podcast, Your Truth Revealed. I remember a few years ago, she told me she'd be interested in talking with me about some undiagnosed health issues she was having, which since then has turned into, well, the story she's about to share with you today. So here's Erica Marcoux. So I have been a counselor for a long time, mm-hmm. had a par- private practice and would teach clients meditation and just noticed even in doing the sessions that I was, I was off and I couldn't tell why I didn't really know what was going on. But How long ago was this? This was in July or August of 2017. It seemed neurological and here I am in the mental health field. I'm thinking, Oh, is there something happening? Like, is this anxiety? What is this? And we've got bipolar in my family, both running on my mom's side and my dad's side. And But at that time, I was like 42, that would be a really late diagnosis for that. So I was trying to rule out like, what the heck is happening? Mm -hmm. And I would have a lot of pain like in my lower back. And what started kind of occurring was I wouldn't be sleeping. So it was like until let's say July, August till Thanksgiving, my sleep was dwindling and dwindling and dwindling. And I was going to doctors, I was trying to figure out what the heck was going on, but my cognitive functioning was getting off, right? Because if you don't sleep, you can actually go into it like a state of psychosis Hmm. pretty quickly. So I just felt like I was kind of hanging on by a thread by the time November happened. And it was also this really weird thing where I would lay down to go to sleep and it would feel like this stinging sensation going from like the, the base of my spine and going up my spine and then my head just felt like it was on fire. Wow. It was intense and meditation got me through. I'm, I'm no joke. Like I would just get into meditation and like notice the weirdness and notice the pain, but stay objective about it. Mm-hmm. That was challenging. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> But it was like 10, 15 years of meditation before that happened that helped me to be able to do that. Um, So I didn't just lose it, right? Um, So I remember being at my mom's house for Thanksgiving and we were playing cards and I just, where it was time for us to go and I just looked at her and I just started bawling. This is not like me, Mm -hmm. this isn't normal, right? And she's like, what's happening? I said, I can't function, I can't go back home. I mean, I I had a teenage daughter at that time who's difficult, (laughs) (laughs) as most teenage daughters can be. And she said, well, why don't you just spend the night? I actually ended up going home. And she said, if something happens, I'll be there for you, right? So it was that night I went to lay down and I just started crying again. And I told my husband, I said, take me to the hospital. How, how did just crying and this emotional thing make you think that there was something bad enough for you to go to the hospital? I felt like I was going crazy. Wow. I don't know how else to describe it. I mean, I, I felt like I was losing touch with reality and I was in pain. I knew something was off, but I didn't know what it was. Did it feel like anxiety also? It felt like anxiety but it also felt like there was something else going on. Like the anxiety was like a byproduct. Was there any like medication or anything that Mm -mm. might've done something? I wasn't on medication at all. So my body was just naturally doing this on its own, right? Just not functioning. And at the time when you asked to go to the hospital, had it been getting worse and worse, ramping up so that that yeah, that's what I mean by like July, August, all the way to November, like sleeping less and less and less and less and everything was just getting worse. So um, I try to lay down and I said, I can't do this anymore. I'm, I'm 
freaking out. I just can't do this anymore. And I said, you need to take me to the hospital. And he wouldn't, which is odd to me still to this day. Why not? I have no idea. I still don't know. Did you ask? Yes. <laughs> I asked many times. And I got so fed up with them that I called my mom. And I, she lives in Wimberley. It's a 45-minute drive. Mm -hmm. And she said, I'll be there as soon as I can. I'll take you. And I remember going into, it's just so odd, but I remember going into my closet, it's a walk-in closet, and all I kept repeating to myself was like, um, what's happening now? What's happening now? And now what's happening? What's happening now? I kept saying this over and over again, and David was just like, what the hell is happening? And I still had that part of me with the objective mind that was like, this is insane but I couldn't stop saying it. Like, what is the next moment gonna bring? What's the next moment gonna bring? What's the next moment gonna bring? That's... Like there was no time to actually be in the, <laughs> exactly. be in the moment because you were saying it so much. Exactly. Just, yeah. Exactly. So my, my daughter I had a, a friend over that night. It was, they're having, when they were up, it was like midnight and they're still laughing and having fun. And I didn't want her to know any of this. So my mom pulled up to our driveway with the headlights off and I just left with her and just again crying. I don't know how else to explain. Like it was just so intense, the experience of it, that that was the only release. It was very primal. So I, I just remember showing up at the hospital and thinking, I'm the one that's supposed to be helping people. Like what the hell am I doing here? Like what is happening to me? And I, I guess just mentally, emotionally, that's what uh, I was thinking of. Had you been seeing any therapists or did you have anyone you could yeah, rely on? I, yeah, I, 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 since I was in grad school, they were required that we be in therapy to be a mm -hmm. counselor, which is smart. Yes, indeed. And not all programs require that, which is odd. Um, so yeah, I had a, a counselor and she, yeah. So you already kind of investigated some of this? beforehand kind of but even sharon was just like it just sounds like anxiety yeah okay but it wasn't just anxiety um so i got to the hospital and they immediately diagnosed me with this insomnia and anxiety okay so they gave me an iv of benadryl and ativan which should knock any adult mm -hmm down right like that was their point was just to get me to sleep yeah i was still sitting up like super erect like that wow. and then i think i slept for about 40 minutes that was it wow. it was it was odd and then the social worker came in and she said i highly recommend that you go to outpatient and that's I don't know if you're familiar with outpatient, but that's where you go for a mental health crisis. And um, so my mom <laughs> stayed with us for two weeks and she would drive me to outpatient. I would be there for about, I don't know, five or six hours. I felt like I was back in preschool or kindergarten. It was bizarre. And so I was there with people with really bad mental health issues and it was funny because they would mistake me as staff. So hmm. they thought I was, you know, mm -hmm. they're helping them. But and the main reason why I elected to stay there for two weeks was because I wanted to be monitored. And um, it was a less expensive way or a way for them to give me medication. They put me on an anti-anxiety and a sleep med. And there was a nurse on staff. So if anything went wrong, wrong i just wanted them to be able to be there i just remember it was all bizarre but let's just put it that way because there are other people <laughs> with like major mental health issues and we're doing group therapy and i was it's just like holy crap i mean people deal with really hard things it gave me a whole new appreciation for for that mm -hmm. one of my most distinct memories was that it was this old office building and it was like, and there was a hallway that was like in a U shape. And I couldn't sit still for very long. Um, so I would go and I would walk it 
right? Just back and forth in this U shape. Now this bizarre carpet, not cute at all. And it had all these squiggly lines and I already felt pretty dizzy and out of it. And it just felt like I was like an acid trip. It, would, <laughs> it just felt <laughs> bizarre, right? Yeah. And my knees felt really weird, like kind of like rubber bands or something. And they weren't really working well. Do you think that was from the meds or? I didn't know. Okay. I didn't know if it was from this, you know, mental health break, which is what they told me I was going through the meds or something else. Cause it still just felt like there was some, a missing piece here that wasn't getting addressed. After that, I made an appointment with a psychiatrist who's, who's really good. He's a more holistic psychiatrist here in Austin. And he asked that I go and get a physical because he said, you know, oftentimes these symptoms of anxiety could be, there could be a physical reason. Of course, all anxiety is physical because it's brain health and the nervous system. Yeah. But we also wanted to look to see if I had an underlying illness that might be triggering that. But all the labs came back normal. So there was no, we didn't do any more investigation at that time. And I started sleeping pretty well and anxiety went way down. And I thought, okay, I'm cured. It's done. But not. Yeah. <laughs> There's more to come. But wait. But wait. <laughs> right. So we, we have these, these neurotransmitters that um, like dopamine, serotonin, um, epinephrine and norepinephrine and they all speak to each other and what it's really what helps us function and my neurotransmitters were still off like even with the medication psychiatrists will kind of say well it has merit to a degree because they think that neurotransmitters change all the time but people who are more holistic say it really is a good snapshot of what's going on in your body. And so for instance, like if dopamine's low, then your drive or motivation is low. If your serotonin's really low, which mine was, um, that causes anxiety. I need to boost both of those. <laughs> we all probably do. We all probably do. Yeah. yeah. And here's the interesting thing is that serotonin is created in the gut, not in your brain. So it's very related to what you eat. But anyway, based on that information, I put myself on a different anti-anxiety that worked even better. So that was good. So after that, I was doing pretty good until I decided to get off the sleep med. It was a heavily sedating sleep med. And you're really not supposed to be on it for long, long term. Mm -hmm. And so just to do the right thing, I got off of it. Well, what's interesting is I started getting really sick. So I think my sleep wasn't as good. And January, February of 2020, I got like, I don't know if it's like a sinus infection and mono. This is, so this is three years of this. Yep. So I got mono. And that was hard to diagnose, but uh, it was so weird. I had this moment of clarity and I was like, I know this feeling. I know this feeling because <laughs> I'd had mono when I was 12 and it was pretty debilitating. And, you know, there's a myth out there that you can't get mono twice, but you I was just going to ask. Yeah. You, and you know. it's, it's caused by the Epstein-Barr virus. And so that Epstein-Barr virus never leaves your body. It just goes dormant. So I got it again. And so I was super sick and we were having, I don't want to bring Alex into this, but she was not doing well at all. Your daughter? Yeah. Um, by March, I think I was still sick and, um, we decided to send her to a therapeutic boarding school and that was a week before COVID hit Austin. We were like in lockdown. Oh so it was fun times. Yeah. And we decided, like a lot of people, that we wanted to get out of the suburbs and go in the outskirts. So we did. And like that September, 
um, we moved into a house in Manchac. And so we got a, a, an older home that was, uh, that's on one and a half acres of land and just kind of shifted my focus to, to the house and renovating it because it was in really bad shape. And meanwhile, your daughter's in this. She is in Montana. Okay. <laughs> 16 and in Montana. And we're like, okay. And the re there is a reason why the house is such a big deal because this house was kind of a blessing and a curse because it finally helped me reveal what the heck has been wrong with me this whole time. Like it was Christmas Eve and I don't know why I have these things like on a holiday, but we had another episode. So I was sitting there and I was wrapping my dad's um, Christmas present. We we're just about to go over to his house and all of a sudden I couldn't breathe. And so I had a panic attack because I couldn't breathe. And I told David to take me to the hospital. And this time he did. Very good. <laughs> good, good job, David. So we got there and they were like, well, there's not really anything that we can do for you. So just calming down helped. But I mean, that was still a pretty bad predicament. And at that point, like I wasn't able to breathe out of my nose very well. And as dissimilar as all of this sounds, it does have a source. <laughs> okay. And um, so I wasn't able to breathe very well, especially when I was laying down to sleep. And then I was having sleep problems again. I was like, oh my God, we've got to fix this. So in February of 2021, I had no surgery. I had like three or four different procedures done. Mm -hmm. And one, I had a deviated septum that I was born with. And mm -hmm. um there's all these other things that they did, but they opened it up and I was like, thank God I can breathe, which has been great. I'm glad that I did that. But then things got even way worse. It was about July and I had a constant headache that wouldn't go away. And it felt like my brain was like swelling and like it had a, um, hat or a cap that was just pushing in uh. so there was no release and my neck was so tight that I could barely bend it or move and my jaw was like super super tight and on top of that I was starting to get really dizzy and my knees were doing that weird sensation again and mm -hmm. um god what else really low energy and I couldn't see very well. So I, I remember going to the optometrist and we <laughs> kept switching out the contacts. I mean, I must've gone back like three different times. And she said, well, it's just old age. This is what happens when you age. And I'm thinking that this is bizarre. So I'm not gonna be able to see the older I get. Mm. I had a suspicion that something was going on with my immune system. So I just switched my diet pretty well pretty dramatically although i've been pretty healthy most of my life with what mm -hmm. i eat um but just got really really clean so then in september um i went to go get a, a routine allergy shots i've been getting allergy shots for like three years no big deal right and so i show up and you know i know the lady behind the desk and i you know it's just very routine and mm -hmm. friendly and um, so I get my shot and we're supposed to wait in the lobby for 20 minutes, which I always thought was just a huge waste of time. Like mm -hmm. I'm never going to have a reaction. So I go to check out after my 20 minutes and, um, the lady behind the desk who, who knows me, she said, you don't look right. And I'm like, I don't feel right. And she said, well, maybe just go and, and sit in the lobby for a little bit longer. And as I was standing there, Everything was getting really dizzy and weird. And then I had that sensation again, like I couldn't breathe, like I'd had on Christmas Eve. And the doctor comes in and he's like, well, <laughs> asking me all these questions. And it was really hard to talk. You know, well, what are you feeling now? And I said, it's the same. I can barely breathe. And he said, okay, well, go ahead and lay down on the, the bed here. And we're going to uh, do an epinephrine shot so mm. there's injections yeah and i had this thought of like you know the movie pulp fiction 
where Uma Thurman has OD'd on something and they stick this yeah. big needle into her heart. And I was like, holy shit, this is going to happen. Like, and he said to me, he's like, well, I've never had to do this before. And I'm like, great. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, he injected me and in, I think my thigh and it was exactly like that movie. I swear to God, I was laying down and all of a sudden when I just went <gasps> like that, wow. and I was like, Oh my God, I can breathe. But it was bizarre. They had to like check my vitals and had to be there for two hours. They wouldn't let me drive home. So I had to call my dad, um, who lived like 10 minutes away, to come and pick me up and take me home. What did they think it was? And we'll... He didn't know. So another mystery, right? Mm -hmm. And he ordered some for me to do some labs. It did look like I had some sort of autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm because there were inflammatory markers that were all in there. Um, it wasn't severe, but it, I think enough for me to be concerned. So after that, I finally got in to see a neurologist, but it was just online so because they weren't letting anybody into the office. So I thought that was pretty pathetic because how is she gonna diagnose if something neurological is happening just over zoom or team yeah. meetings or whatever it was and and she just kind of she kind of had the same like well you're just anxious and you know you're you're fine kind of thing like placating me which clearly i wasn't fine you know i'm just kind of i'm not functioning well at all and i saw my neighbor and told her you know she has already known what was going on but she said you know you may want to um, go see my functional medicine doctor who I've been seeing for like 10 years um, because she's got Hashimoto's disease which is a uh, again another autoimmune illness that she's completely recovered from and has been in remission for a long time so I scheduled to see um, Dr. Tanisha Wards here in South Austin and what was incredible about her was that she spent time with me. I had this huge form to fill out from like the, from the time I was in utero to now. And then we talked for about an hour on Zoom and it was very productive. And she said, I'm almost 100% sure you have Lyme disease. Lyme disease. And I was like, what? <laughs> So she said, you know, we're going to test you for Lyme. We're going to test you for mole toxicity. We're going to test you for um, other tick-borne illnesses, for Epstein-Barr virus, and leaky gut. And I'm like, okay, just whatever you need to do. So after I talked with her at the end of September, she said, well, go ahead and schedule to get your blood work done. And I've given blood I don't know how many times. I mean, it's just not a big deal. Mm -hmm. I've never been faint. I've ne it's never bothered me. Needles don't bother me. But that day I was sitting in the chair and there were two ladies there and I just started getting really <sighs> out of it again. Like losing touch with reality is, is kind of the way to describe it where my body just felt completely off. And eight vials is a lot of blood. So when she put the needle in, I, you know, I was breathing and, but we were probably a vial and a half in. And the weirdest thing was like, I started breathing really heavy and then my limbs went numb from like my elbows to my fingertips. And then my knees to my toes just went numb. I again was like, I need to go to the hospital now. Like, I need a diagnosis now. This is crazy. I've been dealing with this for so long. And then just the crying started happening again where I, I couldn't control any of it. One of the ladies, she seemed kind of freaked out <laughs> by me. And she said, if you can't get yourself under control, we're going to have to reschedule this. And I was like, uh, I, I don't want to reschedule can we just make this happen? And so she kind of showed a different side of her. She, <laughs> the only thing that really worked was for me to like hug her really hard. Can't even imagine like hugging your phlebotomist or whatever. I <laughs> did, I hugged her. <laughs> I don't know if she suggested it or if I just kind of 
was going in that direction. Yeah. Like, I who knows, right? I mean, it was mm. it was an odd moment yeah. for sure. And I could barely walk out of I think it's a Walgreens or something. I could barely walk. So I finally got into the car, and I remember how like light was just so painful. Like it was a bright day and it was, it, it, my headache, it would just make it so much worse. And any kind of noise was really painful. So it's, it was pretty tough getting home and I just probably just went back to sleep. I don't even remember. It's hard to kind of piece all this together. I took a lot of notes cause I'm nerdy that way to kind of track it all. But, um, yeah, there are pieces and parts that I don't remember. Yeah. Are there parts that people tell you about that you've forgotten? David. Yeah. Yeah. Like how bad off I really was. I'm like, yeah, I don't remember just sitting on the couch and staring into space. I don't remember that. <laughs> I don't know. So that was all in September. October, I went to a rheumatologist who diagnoses like six major um, autoimmune illnesses. And we went through this like battery of questions. And I swear to God, it felt like, well, is your hand falling off? Do you have huge sores on your body? Do you, <laughs> it's like, no, 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 no. And she goes, well, you don't have an autoimmune disorder. Um, you're fine. And I'm thinking, okay, this is, it's just, it's just bizarre how so many people in the medical field were like, because you are okay with all these questions that we're asking and all these markers, then you're fine. There's no more investigation and they don't necessarily even refer me to anybody else. It's just a dead end. It just blows my mind. Man. So November 1st, I got my diagnosis finally. And my husband and my daughter and I all went to Dr. Ward's office and I know this is routine for her to just be like, boom, 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 boom. This is what you've got. But for me, it felt like someone just punched me. It was just intense. Um, so basically all the things that she tested me for, I was positive. All of them. Can you, can all you list them, them again? <laughs> yes, I can. Um, I definitely p tested positive for Lyme disease, which she said actually is probably has probably contributed to all my symptoms. Wow. Yeah. Over the last five years. But we think that I probably got it when I was a kid. Can it go dormant? Yes. Really? Yes. Oof. Mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of creepy, right? Yeah. And. And you know, every lots of people were like, "What do you think you got it?" Or what? Happened? I'm like, I don't, "It's a tick. It's really tiny." But yeah. I have memories of going to my grandparents' house in Wimberley, and like grandkids would all be there. We'd stay there often, like for long periods of time in the summer. And right before dinner, we'd all get our tick check. So Granny, my Granny, would take off the ticks from all the kids, and then we could sit and eat dinner. That's pretty obvious there. <laughs> not like i remember maybe i was near a lake or something right. i saw a deer once yeah that's right. the real thing so they don't think that you know people can get lime in central texas sure you can wow yeah and the other thing is that ticks uh can give us all sorts of tick-borne illnesses it's not just lime uh. that's just the most popular but we tested i think for six or eight and i had half of them tested positive for epstein-barr virus which causes the mono Oh, I also had leaky gut. <laughs> What's leaky gut again? I, I, don't... I don't really know if I can explain it, but it's like, I also had a genetic testing, which was really cool. I should add that. Um, so according to my genetics, they can see whether or not you're prone to be sensitive to gluten. So it's, it's different from having a gluten allergy where it's just like this immediate reaction. I don't know how exactly how to explain, <laughs> explain leaky gut, but there's something related to that. Yeah. So um, basically my gut was in bad shape. Um, even though I have not purposely eaten a lot of gluten, it still was, you know, over the years, it's just gotten bad. So, and our immune system um, is related to our gut health. I mean, there. so if your gut is off, your immune system is going to be off. So we had to do gut repair and 
my treatment, which I'll get to. Oh, and the mold. So I had really high levels of mold toxicity in my body. So this is where our house comes into play. <laughs> uh -huh. We had to test our house. And yes, we had mold basically in every sink in our downstairs. Is like, this the new house in Manchac? Yeah, but it's it's new to us, but it was built in 1984. Right. But you'd had some symptoms before this, before you moved there. Yes, but they got worse when I moved into our, our dream home, right? Mm. Out in the country. <laughs> yeah. Fun times. So we tested our house and there are high levels of mold. And I have a yoga room that it was a converted garage. And in there we have a water filtration system because we have well water. There was mold all in that closet. There was a ton of mold in our kitchen sink. Um, you can't see it, but it, it was there. And then in our um, master bathroom sink. So these are like leaks that happen that, you know, you know fix the leak, but maybe don't check to see that there's any mold spores in mm -hmm. the cabinetry and all that kind of thing. So we're like, okay, got to get the mold out of the house. That took, I think, it's like the end of December to the first or second week in February. So we were displaced, basically. You know, in E.T., the movie where there's these guys in hazmat suits and the whole house is like covered in plastic yeah. and E.T. is dying. That's what our house looked like. Oh. And we could barely like maneuver. So we had to leave for about, I don't know, like a week. Um, but it was also kind of scary coming back because it really takes time to get all of the mold out. Just knowing every night I was sleeping in a house that was still had mold in it, but it was just, it's just a process. It took half our savings to clean all this crap up. Oh my God. Yeah. And I stopped working. I stopped seeing clients in July because I couldn't function. And then the cost of paying for the functional medicine doctor out of pocket is another part. It took my insurance company, I think, a month and a half to decide that it was okay to do an MRI on my brain. And that came back normal, which was good, but we still weren't getting to the root of what was happening. And that was in December. Another fun thing that I had to do was the neurologist PA wanted me to do an EEG for three days. So I had a technician come to my house and put all those probes mm -hmm. all over and all that glue is in my hair and I couldn't bathe or wash my hair for three days. And there was this huge, like ancient looking computer on our dining table that was monitoring me. Was it wireless, hopefully? Yes. Okay. <laughs> You're just sitting in a chair for three right, days. Right. It's staring at me. No, but I couldn't really go outside because it couldn't read it that far. Mm -hmm. So I was stuck indoors, which I don't like, but, um, and it came back pretty okay however there are brownouts that happen on the less left hemisphere of my brain and brownouts mean that it, it's not a blackout it's not that mm -hmm. bad but it's um and it's happening right now <laughs> it's just oh God, hello are you right. okay yeah right it's, <laughs> it's where there's not a le enough electricity that moves through the left left hemisphere of my brain and that's another part of this illness is that I'll have brain farts and it's gotten better, but I'll be talking in mid sentence and I can't come up with the word. And there are these long pauses and, um, I just call it my Lyme brain. Like I was trying to be as normal as possible and live a normal life, but like going shopping or stuff like that and talking to the cashier, it's like, it was weird. Yeah, it was like I would just kind of float away. Was there anything that just felt, no, I mean, everybody sort of has these lapses, especially as you get older. Like, is there, was it really prevalent or really intense to where it, it seemed like this is beyond just forgetting someone's name? Yes, yeah. Okay. And especially because I decided to teach my yoga class throughout all of this. I think maybe I took a month off last summer, but it's, it's, it's a sweet group of people that just come to my house and um, their neighbors and my dad is my yoga student. And so is David, my husband. Mm -hmm. And so I would be instructing them and then 
just the words are gone. And I would laugh because, I mean, there's just nothing I can do about it. It's just, and they would be patient with me. And then it would come back. I'm like, okay, now bend your right knee and bring it to your chest. <laughs> Those kind of words, yeah. yeah not, even, like, not even Sanskrit. You know? No, no, no. <laughs> English. Yeah. Yeah. And and I over time, people that I know well were just getting really patient with me. Mm. Like, okay, the word will come. It doesn't all need to happen quickly. So I even thought about with this interview, I'm like, I don't know if I'll be able to talk. So far, so great. So far, so, yeah. <laughs> I, I, who knows, right? And that's what it's been like. And recovering is trying to do new, the things that I would do so easily before. Every day I would try, you know, like something to see if I can get kind of back to normal and try not to get frustrated if it doesn't work out. So basically just get really happy if it does. Because yeah. this illness, there's no control. It's really hard to plan anything because I don't know when I'll just be knocked off my feet and need to like do nothing all day. It's, it's pretty weird. So how far are you like from treatment. where you just left off as far as what's been happening. When is that? Is that the current present day? Or? No. <laughs> oh, we've got more. I got more. Well, this is where it gets kind of interesting, where it, it's the treatment, which I think is a lot more interesting than just being sick and having bizarre symptoms and not knowing what's going on. So this part has been pretty dynamic where I started this seven month program with Dr. Wards and it's very systematic. So um, you start with gut repair and then building up the immune system and the body, making it stronger so then you can tear it down. And the tearing down is killing off all the, basically the bugs and the weird crap that shouldn't be in my body. And we started what's called biocidin drops where I put underneath my tongue. We're supposed to get up to 10 drops. I did one for about a week and a half and all my symptoms got worse. But oftentimes when you get better, when you're trying to get better, when you're taking things to help treat it, it gets worse. But it was to the point where I couldn't function at all. So she said, well, just go down to half a drop. Half a drop. How do you do that? <laughs> Good question. You put it in water and you put in a drop and you drink half the water. Ah, and I awesome. still had a terrible reaction. So she was like, well, clearly your body's not strong enough to be able to start killing the lime. What are uh, these drops? It's, it's called biocidin. It's an antiviral. It's got a ton of different herbs in it. Okay. And that's it. Was this stuff... Uh, um, <laughs> is it contagious what you have? No. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, the, uh, like, was this cor corroborated? That was the word I was trying to think of. With other doctors of yours, like maybe your GP or something. Like, like did they it, know? or did Yeah. They... Or... No. And that's another thing. I went back to my GP, you know, who I've seen for mm -hmm. 12 years. I have Lyme disease. Like, oh, my God, I finally got a, no a diagnosis. And he was like, Congratulations. That's not exactly the response <laughs> that I was looking for. I was kind of like, you know, but we miss this. Like, we miss this big time. And I sent him a video on basically wanting to educate him. Like, if you see these symptoms, mm -hmm. you need to be looking for it. I said, this is a simple urine test. This is not hard. It, I, it just blows my mind. Yeah. But he didn't even know how to test for it. Wow. Yeah, because there are those in the medical community that don't believe it exists. Uh-huh. Yeah. They don't believe Lyme? They don't believe that you can have chronic Lyme. So here's the other thing. Like, you look at the internet and it's like, oh, a tick will, you know, bite you. And then you're supposed to get this perfect bullseye mark. Mm -hmm. Most people don't ever get that. Um, the other thing is they say, oh, antibiotics can help it. Well, yeah, if you catch it within the first 30 days. But if it stays in the system, what it does is it creates some sort of like 
membrane around it. And it goes from acting like a bacteria to more like a virus. And you can't kill it with um, antibiotics at that point. Yeah. So it's chronic Lyme is what I've got. Does it ever lessen with time? Or? Um, we can put it into remission. And that's what the biocidin was supposed to help me do. <laughs> but I wasn't strong enough to be able to, to get it in remission at that point. Uh, recently, I started another type of biocidin, which I'm tolerating pretty well. And so here in the next couple of weeks, I'll start the actual tincture again, and we'll see what happens. What are your symptoms now? So even as I'm talking, I have a pretty bad headache. So I always grade it, right? It's worse. It's like a nine. Right now, it's probably like a seven, but it's persistent, you know, mm -hmm. and, I, and I have this feeling of like fogginess kind of like I'm a little bit underwater and really tired yeah. so I'll probably do this interview and go home and take a nap <laughs> I, I have to say like nothing you're describing is manifesting like for me right now watching you that's what people say yeah it's like I, I have no no idea yeah know? I think that's my personality and that I've, I've gotten that consistently from people like I started doing cupping massage which is super super helpful oh good that has been awesome. And she's like, knowing that you're as sick as you are, she said there are so many people that would just be like depressed or not being proactive and trying to actively heal. But I, I just think that's my personality. I'm a pretty lively person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, I haven't gotten depressed about this. I've, I, it's been more frustration. Yeah. Like I'm stuck in this body that won't function is so sick. And the only option I have is to wake up every morning and do the, the health things that I know will eventually make it better, but it's so slow. So you are you still in a strict like no gluten, no sugar? Oh yeah, no I'll never get off of it uh, ever. The whole goal is to keep the Lyme in remission and the Epstein-Barr virus. And yeah, I'll never eat like a normal American ever again. <laughs> I only eat organic and um, yeah, it's just have to have a super clean diet. I, the other day I will say I cheated and I went to a um, bridal shower party. No, I went to a, um, my mom's partner's dedication. Doesn't really matter, but I had a piece of cake. Three hours later, I thought my my stomach was going to explode. I, it was in so much pain. And what I've learned is that because my diet's been so clean for so long now, any like little thing like that, my body's like, what the hell is this? <laughs> like, what did you just put into me? Um, I, I have other stories about the treatment. Okay. One is really, I think the weirdest thing. Um, <laughs> so I did a colon hydrotherapy, which is, because my liver wasn't detoxing. So we were killing all of these bugs and stuff, but my liver wasn't processing it well enough to be able to eliminate it. Is this all still through your functional medicine, medicine doctor. doctor? Okay. Mm -hmm. She's the one that's healing me. Okay. So she said, go ahead and do colon hydrotherapy. And I, that sounded terrible. I'm like, what do you mean? So I found this place in Round Rock where it's a machine and it looks like a chase lounge. <laughs> But it's like a... That's how they get you. Yeah. <laughs> Please, have a seat. And that's how they presented it. Like, oh, it's relaxing. I'm like, what the... F no, it's not. Um, it looks like a bathtub and a toilet and a, and a chase lounge. <laughs> it's all plastic, right? And then there's this huge tank for water. And it looks like a gigantic measuring glass. Mm -hmm. So it's like eight at the top. And then it's like, goes all the way down to two. So... It's eight gallons of water that goes in and goes out. Whoa. Eight gallons. And the first time I did it, I was doing pretty good. In the midway, I, my face just got flushed. I started sweating, and I thought I was going to vomit. And I'm like, you know, this is relaxing. So the technician came back in, and she's like, are you okay? I'm like, uh, no. <laughs> she said, well, sadly, with Lyme patients, this is kind of normal. But if you keep coming back, it will get better and better. So I did. And by the third one, I felt okay. I mean, it's not pleasant. Mm -hmm. 
but what you can see all the stuff that's coming out so this i don't know if you want to include this but later on that night went to the bathroom i check it because that's a huge part of healing is what's going on with your gut right yeah. and what you're eliminating what was in <laughs> what was in the toilet it looked like a transparent sea cucumber it was bizarre and it was like that big what's that like six and five inches uh, yeah with a little worm attached to it and i took a picture of it and i sent it to my doctor and she said oh this is such good news <laughs> and i'm like what the hell it was a parasite in a parasite nest uh. <laughs> so we could add that to my diagnosis yeah <laughs> oh my god and i maintained a sense of humor i swear uh. i was like i'm not gonna let this like totally freak me out but uh what kind of parasite? What do they know? Well, I don't know. <sighs> and that was just what I saw, right? Like, because I can't see everything that's going out in the colon hydrotherapy because it's too far away. I can kind of see. But the fact that that was the only thing in the toilet. Wow. And I'm like, God dang. But she says that we may not know it, but most of us have parasites. Okay. You get it from the food that you eat. It might have something on it. I would think like the reward would be you get that out and you're like, you're hundred percent, you know? Yeah. You're uh, better. No, it's more like, it's more like this, like, oh, a little bit better. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> but I was the host for that parasite. Well, I feel like a host for the Lyme. Yeah. I feel like a host for the Epstein-Barr virus. Like it's just leaching my energy. It's yeah. weird. Man. Yeah. That, that brings me to a question. Mm -hmm. um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be the host that I am without asking it. Speaking of host, and since you're a good host to all these viruses, <laughs> um, what do you consider the benefit of what you've gone through, if any? There benefits? is a benefit. There's definitely a benefit. And it's more of a spiritual experience that I think I've had throughout this. Um, Alex Marcus. Oh Ooh. my goodness. Wow. Sorry. Cue music. That's my <laughs> Cue spiritual music. Right? It's <laughs> like, that's, yeah, that's my daughter. Um, there has definitely been a, um, mm, a spiritual deepening because I didn't know it was wrong. And being sick for this long, I thought that was the closest I've been to death. I guess in a way and I got to a point where I was like I'm okay with it like if my body wants to shut down or if it did it just didn't scare me mm -hmm. <laughs> like facing it um, I think another part of it was being so my life has been so so simple I mean literally like waking up I take a handful of supplements at different times. Everything was about self-care, being in the moment, because I couldn't handle any complexity at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, my brain just couldn't even handle it. So it's even if I wanted to be more mentally involved in something, it would just dissipate. <laughs> so I think that has helped me appreciate how simple life can actually be. Um, and I've spent a lot of time outside. So we do have uh, an acre and a half of land. And I had carved out this little circle and I have like a uh, lounge chair there. And that's, I'll just sit there just observing nature like really closely. <laughs> There's so many changes that happen every month. It's like a different, seeing different insects, different plants, different, just watching all that. And it's been really very cool. And I, and I assume there's no deers on your property. There's deer. Oh, really? Yeah. We are, have deer. Are they like frightening when you see one? Do you run? Or? No, they're beautiful. They're majestic looking. They're well fed. And I'm just mean because of ticks. And I don't mean. Oh, because of ticks? Yeah. I don't mean because they're dangerous. Or That's anything. really funny. I have no fear of ticks. Really? No, I guess you I, can't get any worse, right? Right. I already <laughs> got it. Like, what are they going to do to me yeah. that I don't already have? Or, wow. yeah, I have no fear of, of that. That's interesting. Yeah. I hadn't even thought about that. Really? Okay. Mm -mm. Sorry to bring it up. <laughs> no, it's fine. But 
I think the other good thing about this is that I have learned so much about my body. And it's not just my body, it's everybody's body. We just don't know these things. Um, and I'm one of those people, if I learn something, my first instinct is to share it. Mm -hmm. So I think it's given me a different kind of purpose. And I don't know why well, I am writing a book about all this. It's kind of hard because there's some months that I don't remember. <laughs> But I took really good notes, so we'll see if I can cobble it together. But um, yeah, I'm writing a book and then kind of shifting the focus of my podcast. Tell and me about your podcast. Yeah, it before there was like the before the diagnosis and then mm -hmm. after, you know, um, before it was focused on m mental health um, as it relates to understanding physically what's going on with our bodies. So I was interviewing um, industry professionals, helping professionals. What's the name of the podcast? Um, Your Truth Revealed. And I have one more interview that I'm going to um, release, but then after that, it's going to shift. So it may be more me talking and sharing the things that I'm learning and what's working and what's not. Um, and I want to interview like my doctor and other people that have helped me along the way. So it might be focused more on um, chronic illness, um, autoimmune things. Because if we look back, like my body has been severely stressed. I think a large part of why I had anxiety and insomnia was because of the Lyme disease. Yeah. It's stressful. The yeah. body's trying to fight something and it just can't um, win. It's always under duress. So Had you in your life experienced much anxiety before that? Well, looking back, I'm like, oh, heck, that was a Lyme flare-up. That was a Lyme flare-up. I just didn't know. What 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 are you calling a Lyme flare-up? A Lyme flare-up is these crazy symptoms. I mean, they weren't as severe when I was younger, but when I was in grad school, it was similar, like where I just had no energy. And... um would be in bed all the time. I, I can remember I was seeing clients um, as my internship after I graduated. I would go home, sleep, and go and see a client or two. It was just down the road. And then go back and lay down again. And, mm. and I thought it was anxiety, but I was sick. And, this, and I was seeing a counselor then, and they were like, oh, yeah, it's just anxiety. So, it all, you know, it's like the... What is that silly saying? Like, if you have a hammer, everything is a nail. So everybody was treating it like a mental health issue. But that's that's one of my things, though. It's all interconnected. You can't separate out. Right. Well, that's just a psychological issue. Right. It, it, and it's all brain health because the, the Lyme has attacked my central nervous system. And from what I understand, that's why... I, most of my symptoms are here is that um, it will hide out where the immune system can't really get to it easily and um, it likes to be in joints so like my jaw joint in particular uh, my knee joints at one point it was even in like my index finger like I couldn't write because mm -hmm. it was so stiff and so painful yeah little boogers <laughs> And there's no uh, no real cure. They can maybe can go into remission, but there's no right. guarantee or way to there's do no that. There's no cure. There's wow. no cure for Epstein Barr virus either. Is there any newer uh, technologies or medicines or things that you're learning about that might that are more helpful than anything else that's happened? No, nope. not yeah. that I know of. Have you have you met or talked to people who've had Lyme? Yeah, this is kind of a wild story, too. Um, so the summer of 2021, before my headaches got really, really bad, um, I was taking horseback riding lessons in my neighborhood, which I just thought was the coolest thing. I put my cowboy boots on and just walked to the stables. I only had like five lessons, but one day I got off my horse. It was early in the morning. And there was a lady there with her eight-year-old daughter who's going to get on the same horse to do her lessons. And I t ended up talking to this girl's mom for like an hour during the whole lesson. 
she and I became friends on Facebook. And when I got my diagnosis in November, I, I posted something. I just said, this is, these are all the symptoms and this is finally my diagnosis. And she texted me and said, I cannot believe that. She goes, I have Lyme too. And she was diagnosed that January and was also seeing my same doctor. Really? Yeah. So she and I have been buddies and helping each other through this. Um, she has very, very similar sy symptoms. I don't think she has as many headaches, but um, just the lethargy, not being able to get through the day, not being able to work. And she's got two young daughters that she cares for, but it's a very limited life. It's very simple. Yeah, but she's doing better. She's not... Um, it's not fully in remission yet. So that's been a year and a half of treatment yet. What's, is there an average length of treatment that might, you know, suggest when it would go into remission? Well, Dr. Ward says, okay, you can go through our seven month program and you're healed. Well, that means I would have been healed by now. And I'm like, clearly I'm not. When did so, that end? <laughs> this month it ends. Oh, well, I'll give it a month or two. Well, yeah, I think. <laughs> I think this is, I, having a, a, a healthy expectation, I think is important. So I think by December, I'll feel a lot better. And I am making steps towards that. It seems like every month lately, I've been getting better and better. Do you think if it goes into remission, you can ease up on other health habits? Not that you would want to per se, but if it's like, I'm not going to, cause yeah. I don't ever want to feel this way again in my life. That's if smart. there's anything that I can do to prevent this from happening again, oh my God, I'll do it. So yeah. I don't, I won't change my diet at all. Not at all. It's not worth it. Was your immune system, as far as you know, sound before you got Lyme disease? But I now that I'm saying that, I realize you're a kid. I don't know, because I was probably it. like eight yeah. when I got it, I think. <laughs> were you a healthy five-year-old? <laughs> Oh. <laughs> I had seasonal allergies, but uh -huh. yeah, I was a healthy five-year-old. Right. But yeah, Austin is just allergies are just so bad. Yeah. But um, I just remember getting really sick when I was 12, and that was with mono um, and chicken pox. And if you add Lyme to that, I think maybe that's why I had such a severe reaction to it, because I almost missed all of sixth grade. Yeah. Yeah. Have you thought of yourself as a generally healthy person? Yes. And that this is the funny part. My friends and family think I'm like the healthiest person because I, I'm so meticulous and um, generally look healthy. So it's it, they have always been confused as to why, you know, I... And this has happened for a long time, but I'll be like, oh, I'm too sick to like hang out or whatever. And they're like, how is it that you're sick? You barely drink alcohol. Like you do, you do all the right things. So yeah, I don't know. That's good. I mean, I mean, you're, it sounds like you just have this resilience too. I think it's more like- Stubbornness? No. <laughs> I'm it's very stubborn. Yeah. Oh, I wouldn't even call it stubborn. I call myself tenac tenacious E. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I'm ten tenacious and I won't give up. I mean, here's the other part. I think that's more my soul or my spirit. You know, I mean, my body may be not functioning well, but um, I'm still here. You know, and I want to make the most of this. I don't. I don't want to just be sick the rest of my life like this. It's terrible. Yeah. And it's, it's been really hard where I've had moments with Dr. Words. I'm like crying because I'm like, I'm not getting any better. And she's like, well, do you want to get better? And I'm like, yeah, because she comes across patients that don't, that have just given up. And she just kept telling me, well, don't give up on me. I'm not going to give up on you. And I said, Tanisha, you're my only hope. Like, <laughs> if I don't do this, like, what's the alternative? Miser more misery? Yeah. No, thank you. Do you feel a lot better now than over the last seven months? Has it improved? I think so. I mean, the fact that I even reached out to you is a sign to me like, oh, I must feel well enough to talk for an hour or, you know? Yeah. So that's one of those things, again, like just kind of doing things that I would have done when I felt better and just seeing how it goes. Yeah. Yeah. I can't remember when, when you first brought up that you could be a guest on this like three years ago. Mm-hmm. 
Was that because of Lyme disease or did it, were you not diagnosed then? That was because of my weird episode with insomnia and yeah. So you didn't really have a, a diagnosis uh-uh. of that? Uh-uh. I didn't know how sick I was. I'm glad we waited. <laughs> I know, right? Like, like, now I have the story. <laughs> yeah. Now I can at least come <laughs> up with something in the story. title. You know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Eric yeah. and some shit going on. Right. No. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know what it is. Yeah. Still undetermined. Uh, yeah. Wow. I'm, I'm curious again about the your GP and just the general medical community because it sounds like you're kind of taking this alternative approach, mm-hmm. but, but do you also feel like uh, you've tried to educate them, but are they also concerned as your doctor? No. It, no one has checked in with me. I even went back to my um, the rheumatologist that I saw, mm-hmm. and I was like, I have a diagnosis. Like, I have Lyme disease. She didn't even respond. That's so weird. Are there any other specialists in the medical community that work with Lyme specifically? Not that I know of. I think that Dr. Ward said there's one doctor in Austin who does, and that's medical treatment. Yeah. And she just in passing was like, you know, I could refer you to him because I just wasn't progressing with the treatment as fast as her other patients. She said, but I don't think your body can handle it. Hmm. I mean, if you can't handle the herbs, yeah. that would probably be way too harsh. So I don't even know what it what it is. I'm not even considering it. It's not on my radar, but. Yeah. And yeah, like the, um, the Center for Disease Control doesn't even acknowledge chronic Lyme as a disease. Really? Mm-hmm. I feel like I just looked it up and it, it seems legit somewhere. Maybe, maybe it shifted. It maybe maybe enough people were mad and yeah. like, yeah. I think there's a documentary coming out, like The Monster Inside Me, which I'm kind of scared to watch, but it's about Lyme patients. Yeah. But there's a huge stink like where people like, <laughs> like us are just like, the heck, you think this isn't real? We're Lyme and proud. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or I would like to like... The doctor that says it's not real, I'd like to give them Lyme and see how, yeah. that, how that feels. Yeah. yeah. I've known a couple people with Lyme, actually. Have you? I, yeah, I haven't talked at length, but it was that roller coaster of symptoms yeah. and never getting over it. It's, yep. Although I think it went into remission with one of them. So. Good. Yeah. Well, that gives me hope. Yeah. I mean, I would, the more people I hear that are actually in remission and feeling good, yeah. that's, a, that's a big deal to me. So first of all, you really have to want to heal and that and being focused on the goal of healing because our bodies are designed to keep adapting. And I never knew that before this journey. So let's say like with Lyme, so your body's gonna adapt as best as it can to having Lyme in the system, right? And so you just get further and further away from this super healthy like state, which is what I'm aiming for. So it's a challenge, right? Because we're going against what our own bodies are designed to do. Our bodies are designed to keep adapting, but not necessarily designed to maintain optimal health at all times. Probably the the things that have helped the most are, you know, working with the functional medicine doctor and getting to the root cause instead of just the symptoms, the gut repair is a big deal. Like anyone who's suffering from autoimmune, diet, 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 you gotta watch it. So I'm on the paleo diet and also um, the anti-inflammatory diet because there's a lot of foods out there that you think are healthy that are really terrible for me. Mm -hmm. Like um, avocados. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, eggs. Uh-huh. Uh, Just took away my breakfast. <laughs> right. Any grain, even quinoa. Like you think about these healthy things that it <laughs> just is so hard on me. Um, I'll take that with a grain of salt. Is salt one too? <laughs> right. <laughs> I can eat salt. I can eat salt. Um, and I also have a histamine intolerance. So that means that I can't like eat strawberries or... There's just a whole host of things that I can't yeah. eat. Whew. Yeah, which has been challenging because I got to the point where I wasn't eating much because, well, first of all, I didn't have the energy to cook. 
Second of all, it was like, there's so many foods I can't eat, um, but it's gotten a lot better because I just stock it, my kitchen full of things that I can just grab and eat and are simple. There's a lot of really good options. Thanks for talking with me, Eric. Good. Thank you yeah. for listening. Yeah. It's it's very rare that I would just talk <laughs> without it being conversational, so it's a little awkward. Right. But that's okay. Well, all right. Thanks for listening. And thanks again to Erica Marcoux for sharing her story. Check out her podcast, Your Truth Revealed, or visit ericamarcoux.com. And you can listen to this podcast wherever you're listening to it now. Also, uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and please subscribe where you can. Finally, we could use your support to help produce the show, keep it ad-free, and keep it coming. So visit patreon.com slash friendswithdeficits for more information. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash friendswithdeficits. Once again, I'm Adam Sultan, and remember... When life gives you lime, uh, you know the rest. <laughs>